In the last video, we talked about the Athenian victory over the Peloponnesian navy at Sinosima in 411 BC, and this reestablished the Athenians as the masters of the sea. But, as we talked about, the Peloponnesian navy was able to retreat and set up shop at Abydos. Now, this was a critical victory for the Athenians because it prevented an interruption of the food supplies from the Black Sea, and it also boosted the morale of the Athenian army. Had the Athenians lost this sea battle, this might have ended the war altogether, as the Athenians would have lost their critical grain supply from the Black Sea. Now, of course, we talked about Thrasybulus as the main admiral at that sea battle. But you might ask, where was Alcibiades during all this? He was on the island of Samos, maintaining control of the rear guard. But everything started to shift toward the Hellespont because both sides realized that this could be a war-winning battle. And so after the Battle of Sinosima, the Peloponnesians were able to retreat to Abydos and established their main base there. The Athenians established a base at Sestos, which was right across the straits, and this was probably done so that they could keep a watchful eye on the Peloponnesian navy. The Peloponnesians were supported by the Persian satrap Pharnabasis, and he supported the Peloponnesians on land. And that set up the next key naval battle, the Battle of Abydos, which we'll get to in the next slide. Now, before we get to the Battle of Abydos, I should mention that this is the first battle which is not described by Thucydides. His narrative on the Peloponnesian War ended right before this battle. And so we have to rely on Xenophon to pick up where Thucydides left off. Now, it is unclear exactly why Thucydides' narrative ends before this battle, and there are many questions left unanswered. Why did he not finish off his narrative on the Peloponnesian War? Some have speculated that he died, but it really is unclear exactly what happened and why this happened. But I would like to take a few moments to talk about Thucydides. I think he is one of the great historians of all time. He was really the first historian to try to get the facts straight as he saw them. And his impact on all future historians has been immeasurable. Many future Greek and Roman historians would emulate Thucydides in the way they wrote about history. So he had a titanic influence on future historians. He set strict evidence-gathering methods without talking about the intervention of the gods. But perhaps most important of all, Thucydides, as we talked about in past lectures, tried to understand the root causes of wars, and specifically, of course, the Peloponnesian War. And one of those causes, of course, was human emotion, and specifically fear. And he talked about the Spartan fear of the growing Athenian Empire. And so he believed the events that caused the Peloponnesian War would resurface in the future. And so one of the reasons that he wrote his narrative was for posterity. He really believed that history would repeat itself. And the events that caused the Peloponnesian War would be the same events that caused future wars. And many future historians have noted similarities to the Peloponnesian War. For instance, many have identified the causes of World War I as being similar to the events that caused the Peloponnesian War. Okay, so let's move on. And so as I said, Xenophon picks up where Thucydides left off. Now, Mindarus, who is in charge of the Peloponnesian fleet, requested additional reinforcements to join him at Abydos, and this involved 14 Syracusan ships. But before reaching Abydos, that contingent of reinforcements was picked off by Athenian lookouts and driven ashore. Mindarus decided to rescue these ships and led his fleet out of Abydos, and the Athenians also set sail from Sestos to challenge him, and so the Battle of Abydos was underway. The Athenians had 74 ships in their fleet, and the Peloponnesians had 97 ships. And so the battle began with a signal from both commanders. And this was an evenly matched fight. It would go on and on almost the entire day with neither side gaining a decisive advantage. But then a contingent of 18 triremes appeared on the horizon, and both sides believed that these reinforcements might be theirs. But as these 18 triremes grew closer, a red flag was hoisted, signaling that these were Athenian ships. And who was in charge of these ships? None other than Alcibiades. He had been dispatched from Samos, and this turned the tide of the battle. 
Realizing he faced mortal danger, Mandaris fled back to Abydos, but he lost several ships in the process, as the Athenians attacked the Peloponnesian navy in retreat. The Athenians would go on to capture 30 Spartan ships, and even recovered 15 of their own that the Spartans had taken from the previous battle. And so it was another serious defeat for the Spartans. At Abydos, Mandaris was forced to repair his battered fleet. He also dispatched messengers to Sparta, asking for critical reinforcements. He also met with Pharnabasis to plan future campaigns. And so once again, it's important to note that even though the Athenians secured another victory, it was not a decisive victory in that the Peloponnesian fleet still remained in the Hellespont. And so the Athenians were still intent on kicking the Peloponnesian navy out of the Hellespont to keep their vital grain supply uninterrupted. Now shortly after this battle, a couple of unusual events occurred. The Persian satrap Tisiphern arrived from the south. Now this was not his domain, it was Pharnabasis who controlled the territory near the Hellespont. But Tisiphern undoubtedly didn't want to let Pharnabasis steal all the glory, and so he arrived as well. Now in another strange event, Alcibiades decided to approach Tisiphern. Tisiphern. But Alcibiades completely misjudged the demeanor of Tisiphern because Tisiphern wanted nothing to do with Alcibiades and he had him arrested and imprisoned at Sardis. But Alcibiades escaped within a month and was able to make his way back to the Athenian positions. This also represents Alcibiades' incredible belief in his own skills to move people in authority. However, this gambit backfired, but as I said, he was able to rejoin the Athenians. Now, after the Athenian victory at Abydos, it would have been advantageous for the Athenians to press on with the attack, but the Athenians were unable to follow through on their victory because the Athenian treasury was nearly depleted, and so this temporarily hampered operations. And this gave Mandaris critical time, time to build a new fleet of 80 ships, and this was accomplished with the help of the Persians. And so the Peloponnesians and Persians were able to plan a new offensive, and that occurred in the spring of 410 BC, when Mandaris was able to capture the city of Sisychus. The Athenians desperately wanted to take Sisychus back, and so they set sail with a fleet of 86 ships. Now the Athenians decided to use a little trickery here. The Athenians divided their fleet into three. There were 20 ships under Alcibiades, with two other squadrons left behind, one of which was commanded by Thrasybulus, who of course was the hero at Sinosima. Now Alcibiades, with his 20 ships, advanced towards Sisychus. Now Mandaris was amazed to see this small little contingent attacking the city, and so he set out towards Alcibiades with his entire fleet. Alcibiades simply turned his fleet around and feigned retreat, with Mandaris' ships in hot pursuit. Once outside the harbor, Alcibiades turned his fleet around yet again to face Mandaris, and then the trap was set. Thrasybulus and the other forces surrounded the Peloponnesians. Mandaris, who was now caught in a vice, fled in the only direction that was available to him, and that was the beach. And so he beached all of his ships. Alcibiades followed in hot pursuit and also landed and attempted to pull the Spartan ships back out to sea with grappling hooks. But the Persian satrap Pharnabasis arrived and began to drive back the Athenians off the shore. Seeing that Alcibiades was in trouble, Thrasybulus also landed his squadron as a diversion, but it was clear the Persian forces were superior to anything the Athenians had on land, and so both Alcibiades and Thrasybulus were driven back. But then the third Athenian squadron landed, and that changed the tide, and both the Spartans and Persians were defeated, and Mandaris was actually killed in combat, and even worse, almost all the Spartan ships were captured. And so it was a major victory for the Athenians, and now they had full control of the Hellespont. Predictably, the next day, Sisychus fell to the Athenians, and the war had taken yet another dramatic turn. It is important to note, however, that although the Peloponnesian navy was non-existent at sea in the Hellespont, they still maintained some land forces around the Hellespont. Now, after the Hellespont sea battles, the Athenian treasury was a problem yet again and so they were unable to press on and perhaps end the war outright. And the Spartans had lost most of their fleet during those engagements with the Athenians in the Hellespont. And so both sides took stock of the situation, and the Spartans decided they wanted out of the war. 
and so they sent peace envoys to Athens. Now, it's important to note at this time, the 5,000 were still running the show in Athens. Now, in terms of those peace offerings, the Athenians believed after the successes in the Hellespont, they could reclaim their possessions in the Aegean, especially since the Spartan fleet was almost non-existent. And so the Athenians rejected the Spartan peace offering. A short time later, full democracy was restored in Athens. But some problems started to occur for the Athenians that probably made them think twice about rejecting the Spartans. Pylos was captured by the Spartans a few months later. Nicaea was also taken back by the Megarians, and despite all the troubles at sea, the Peloponnesians still had land forces in the Hellespont, and of course there were the Persians to deal with. And so after several delays, Athens finally decided to get serious about the Hellespont again, and in 409 BC they dispatched a new force to free the Hellespont permanently from the Persians and Spartans, and we'll get to that in the next video.